Hallelujah. Your expectations will not be cut off. I say your dreams will find expression in the name of Jesus. You will not be a spectator in this city. That which is your portion in this land you will possess. You will possess your own portion in this city. In the name of Jesus. You will flourish and prosper in this land. In this city your industry will grow. The Lord will make a name for you. In your field of endeavor you will prosper. In the mountain he has reserved for you, you will possess it. You will take it over. In the name of Jesus. If you believe it, say a big amen. Please, you may be seated. God bless you. Hallelujah. We are grateful to God for his mighty presence in our midst. Thank you, precious voices for the manifestation of God's presence at all times. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Every second Sunday of the month is our family life Sunday. So thank you because we know that whatever it is that is going amiss in our families, the ultimate God, the infinite God, uh, will cause there to be restoration in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Uh, last Sunday, we continued in our study of this season, understanding different kinds of wars and warfare strategy. And uh, we began to look at psychological warfare. So please open your Bibles with me to one text, Psalm 140, Psalm 140 from verses 4 and 5. We'll read from the NIV. Psalm 140, verses 4 and 5. Keep me safe, Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Protect me from the violent who devise ways to trip my feet. Can I have an amen? The arrogant have hidden a snare for me. They have spread out the cords of their net and have set traps for me along my path. But the wicked will fall into their own nets. And you will escape in the name of Jesus. Every net that the wicked has set for you will catch themselves. Hallelujah. So we looked at this scripture and began to talk about psychological warfare. And um, I will recap the definition of psychological warfare that we gave us. We said it's the planned, tactical use of propaganda, threats, and other non-combat techniques during wars or threats of war or periods of geopolitical unrest to mislead, intimidate, demoralize, or otherwise influence the thinking or behavior of an enemy. And after looking at the foundations, we went ahead to talk about the objectives of psychological warfare. But this morning, as we move straight on, uh, let's look at the tools of psychological warfare. You have the definition in your hand. You know what the objectives are. What are the tools of psychological warfare? The tools. One thing you must understand that the main target of psychological warfare is to capture your hearts and your minds. That's what the enemy wants to do. That is his main objective. That is the main target, to capture your mind and your heart. So consequently, one major tool that he uses is propaganda. Is propaganda to influence the values, your beliefs, your emotions, your reasoning, 
You know, it manipulates your emotions, manipulates your reasonings, your motives, and eventually your behavior. So one major tool that he uses is propaganda to influence your values, your beliefs, your emotions, your reasoning, and your motives. Somebody is then asking a question, what is propaganda? Propaganda simply means information. So he uses information to manipulate your mind. To manipulate your emotions. Propaganda means hyping. To hype. Propaganda means advertising. Through advertisements. A product that is seemingly bad and evil and injurious to your health. Can be presented in such a manner that you fall in love with it. Through advertising. Again, through marketing. Propaganda is marketing. Market a product that is toxic. Spend money. Package it. Get your social media actors or your social media personalities. Use it to brand their ethato toxic product and you begin to fall in love with it. What are they doing? They are manipulating your emotions. Manipulating your reasoning. So propaganda is Publicity. It's publicity, information, hyping, advertising, mark publicity. And I love this one. Another synonym for propaganda is puffery. To puff up. It's propaganda. We have many paper tigers who have no weight. But they ride on the back of the media and then you see them as tigers. Meanwhile, there is nothing behind them. That is propaganda. Hallelujah. So, the major tool is propaganda. And we have said propaganda means information. It means hyping. It means advertising, marketing, publicity, and all the likes. Then what are the media through which this psychological operation propaganda are disseminated? If propaganda is information, if it's marketing, if it's publicity, what are the media through which they are disseminated? Number one, through face-to-face -face verbal communication. Propaganda is pushed through face-to-face -face verbal communication. Many years ago, I know they still do them on specialized channels now, but on the popular NTA or WNTV of those days, they used to show wrestling at 11 p.m. I don't know whether I, many of some of you remember those times. We were probably very, very young because I was all equally young myself. At 11 p.m., and I can still remember some of the names, Mil Mascaras. Who else? Mighty Eagle. Those are the guys. Hallelujah. So when those guys come on, what do they do? They first burst. The man is beating his chest and he's busting. How we break his arm, how we break his leg. He's going to live here headless. That is proper what? Ganda. Face-to-face -face verbal communication. And when he does that, Mil Mascaras will jump from where he is and climb the rope. And from the rope, he will just dive down and do this and make so much noise. The battle has not even started. Can I have an Amen. What is that called? Propaganda. Face-to-face -face verbal communication. So it takes place through face-to-face -face verbal communication. Another way through which propaganda is disseminated is through audiovisual media like the TV, your movies, and your games. Audiovisual media like your TV, movies, and your games. And this is very, very serious. You know the influence and the power of the media, especially the audiovisual media, the television. It's gradually being replaced by the social media now. Before now, you need to get home before you watch your television. But right where you are on the go, you can tune on to YouTube. And then you are live with your television, with your channels, with your NTA, and with 
even the unconventional audiovisual platforms. Videos that are recorded by amateurs. And all these constitute propaganda in one form or the other. Praise ye the Lord. Now, in North Korea, psychological operational propaganda, they have been able to use the media movies, the television, and games to prosecute and to prep up their children in mounting propaganda against the United States. A couple of, maybe about a year ago, I can't remember exactly when, I watched a documentary on the television by CNN. When U.S. and North Korea, when Trump came in and he began to warm up towards North Korea, and one of their correspondents went to the cities of North Korea and began to interview people about North Korea. And it is discovered that children in elementary school, psychological warfare, they, they were prepared against uh, using propaganda to prosecute their war against the United States. What do they do? They teach these children right from elementary school that United States is the enemy. So through their curriculum, if there is any illustration that needs to be done against the enemy, it is the U.S. that is the enemy. So in their games, they manufactured games and developed games, and the target of the game is United States of America. What are they doing? They are using propaganda, psychological operations to prepare their children. So right from that early stage, these children grow up to hate anything America. That is propaganda. They use games. They went into the toy shop. And then you see them, North Koreans, and the target is always U.S. They are always tag the enemy. And every average North Korea, there is nothing good they have to say about the U.S. Why? Because they have been indoctrinated through the audiovisual means. Television, their curriculum in schools, the games that even the children buy as toys. Shout hallelujah. Glory to God. So what am I saying? These medias are powerful medias, TV, movies, and games. They use them to disseminate their propaganda war. Hallelujah. Again, if I come to the West, that is the East. How many of you have heard of Fox News? Okay. That is a typical propaganda machine for the Republicans of the United States. Why? Every of the agenda is pushed through Fox News. Amen? That is their, that's their platform. And they tilt the information and skew it to favor their cause. So it's a propaganda machine. Can I have an Amen. Every government always have their leanings. They have their propaganda machines that are used to project what they believe. Can I have an amen? amen. Again, we have audio-only media like the radio. The radio. Yes, they use the radio to propagate and push their agenda. Radios constitute propaganda machines. And also, you have purely visual media like newspapers, which I talked about, leaflets, books, posters, and all of the likes. Again, another medium, number five, is human lobbyists. We call them lobbyists, agents, that governments engage, companies engage, individuals engage to lobby for them and to push their agenda. Can I have an amen? Presently, one of the guys that was recently jailed the campaign operations chief of Mr. Trump, Paul Manafort. He was jailed for 47 months a few days ago. And what was his role? He was a campaign chief. But amongst the allegations leveled against him, he was known as a powerful lobbyist in Washington. He will learn the government, the Ukrainian government, for many years. He was on their payroll. He got contracts from them to launder their image before the U.S. government. So they lobby the legislators, lobby the Washington, lobby the policy people to push and propagate the agenda of their, the people they are representing. 
Can I have an amen? So we are talking of the media through which psychological warfare is disseminated. Shout hallelujah. So, number five, what is the message of propaganda? What is the message? What message do they carry? And how do they influence or persuade their target audience? Praise ye the Lord. We'll come to that in a minute. But let me say to you that there are three categories of psychological warfare. Three categories of propaganda, as it were. And a man who was a CIA operative in the 40s, and especially during the Second World War, his name is Daniel Lerner, L-E-R-N-E-R, Daniel Lerner. He was a former CIA operative, and he wrote a book in 1949 titled Psychological Warfare Against Nazi Germany. In that book, he details the U.S. military's World War II psychological warfare campaign. And in that book, he categorized propaganda into three. Hallelujah. And I'm sure we can learn a few things from it. Number one, which is the first category? He calls them white propaganda. White propaganda. And what does this mean? This means information that is truthful. Please take note and write now. Information that is truthful and only moderately biased. It is a true information, but it is only moderately biased. And then the source of the information is cited. It cites the information. So we call that white propaganda. Information that is truthful and mostly biased. Only moderately biased. Then the source of the information is cited. Number two, the second category of propaganda. He calls it gray propaganda. Gray, G-R-E-Y. White, then gray. For gray propaganda, he says the information is mostly truthful. It's mostly truthful and contains no information that can be disproven. And this is dangerous. The information is mostly truthful and contains no information that can be disproven. You can't disprove any of this information that is given out. However, no sources are cited. But when you hear such information, it's mostly truthful. And it contains no information you can disprove. But friends, read my lips. When it says mostly truthful, that means it's not 100% truthful. For white propaganda, the information is 100% truth. But it is moderately biased. And the source is cited. It changes the tone. The way they read it to you is not how exactly it happened. But the statement is true. That's white propaganda. But for gray propaganda, it's mostly truthful. And there is no information you can disprove there. Yet, the source is not cited. And then the third category is called black propaganda. So there's a white, there's gray, then black. Black propaganda. Literally, this is what Mr. Trump has made popular. Called fake news. So black propaganda is fake news. The information is false, is deceitful, and is attributed to fake sources not responsible for his creation. The information is false, is fake, is deceitful, and is attributed to fake sources. They just say it's from so-so and so, whereas that source has nothing to do with it. That is black propaganda. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In the days ahead, if we are not able to get there today, I will show you from the scriptures Typical examples of a white propaganda, a gray propaganda, 
and a black propaganda. Amen. So what are the elements? I said earlier, the message or the elements of psychological warfare. In other words, if you want to know whether an information is a propaganda, what are the elements that it must contain? So we'll go back to the definition of propaganda. Hallelujah. We said it's the tactical use of propaganda, threats, and other non-combat techniques to mislead. So the first element of propaganda is mislead. To mislead. To mislead you. Remember we said propaganda is information. Any information at all. So how do you know whether it's a propaganda? Number one, if it is to mislead you. The objective is to mislead you. What does it mean to mislead? To deceive. The information is meant to deceive you. Secondly, to bamboozle you. To bamboozle you. To rattle you. Number three, to hoodwink you. I'm still defining mislead. To put a wool over your face. That's what it means to hoodwink you. It is to distort your view. To distort the truth. To mislead means to distort. It also means to confuse you. You're on the right path. But if somebody introduces an information that confuses you. You don't even know what to do anymore. Because of an information that you have received. Can I have an amen? That's propaganda. It will mislead you. It will deceive you. It will bamboozle you. It will hoodwink you. And bring confusion into your heart. That's, an, that's, what, that's the first element. To mislead. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Is someone here this morning? What's the second element of psychological warfare? To intimidate you. Intimidate. What does it mean to intimidate? To scare you. They release an information and scares the daylight out of you. How many of you know that the general turnout of this election is so terrible? Right? People just simply refuse. Who wants to go and waste his life? Because of some politicians. So everybody rather. And do you blame them? Thugs will come to the polling booth and shoot into the air. Pa, 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 pa. And everybody scares off. But that is physical. But they release information to you. And before you know it, that information is, eh? If not so, <laughs> let me stay in my house. That's propaganda. It's to intimidate you, to scare you, to terrify you. To intimidate means to threaten you. To threaten you. To intimidate means to bully you. They bully you with an information. You receive an information and say, eh, if that is the case, every man to your tent, O Israel. To intimidate you. Again, to intimidate means to frighten you. It scares you. It frightens you. It terrorizes you. And it daunts you. These are synonyms of intimidates. The number three element of psychological warfare is to demoralize you. To demoralize you. What does it mean to demoralize you? To discourage you. To take the courage out of you. It demoralizes you. Have you had such an information? Have you had such a news that demoralizes you? It discourages you. It dispirits you. In other words, takes the spirit away from you. You have no more strength to do anything. You are just weak. It paralyzes you. That's a propaganda. It depresses you. It deflects you. All the strength you have been gathering. Men will go out that day and mobilize ourselves. And we'll, we'll, when we get there, we are going to vote on block. And then you hear that, ah, if you see those thugs, and then it just deflates you. You are deflated. You know, it takes the strength out of you. It demoralizes you. That is propaganda. Hallelujah. And the fourth element of psychological warfare 
is to influence negatively your thinking or your behavior. It influences you negatively in your thinking and in your behavior. Shout hallelujah. So let's quickly go into the scriptures and see an example of what this psychological warfare is all about. Let's go to 2 Kings. The book of 2 Kings chapter 18. And let's look at the story of a man known as King Ezekiah of Judah. A man that enjoyed the grace of God in no small measure. 2 Kings chapter 18. Let's quickly read from verse 1. And then we jump to 17. From verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 18 from verse 1. Let's look at how these things interplay. How you can be misled. How you can be demoralized. How you can be intimate, intimidated. Just through information. Through information. No carrying of bullets. No carrying of guns. Just through information. We are talking of psychological warfare. Not using instruments of war. But just words. Information through hyping. Second Kings chapter 18. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, the king of Israel, that Ezekiah, the son of Ahaz, the king of Judah, began to reign. Verse 2. He was 25 years old when he became king, full of energy, youthful, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. May the Lord help you to do what is right. In that position he has placed you, may he guide you to do what is right. I say, may error have no part in your life. In the name of Jesus. May the spirit of error have no room in your life. In the name of Jesus. He ruled for 29 years in Jerusalem. Verse 4 says, he removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars. He cut down the wooden image and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it what? Nehushtan. Bronze serpent of Exodus. It was still there. It has become institutionalized. And they call it Nehushtan. Can I have an amen? amen? He took Hezekiah to break down those high places. Verse 5 says, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. Please jump to verse 17. Let's fast track because of our time. This king loved the Lord, and he was a man of peace. He began to do great things. He began to develop infrastructure. He brought water. There was no water in Judah. He built an aqueduct that was used to transport water. And we know water is life for his people. These great things he did. And he was a man of peace. He fought the Philistines, pushed them back. And he was able to secure his territory. Until one king of Assyria came and began to torment him. When the king came, what did he do? He says, look, what do you do? I know we have sinned. Is it gold you want? Is it silver you want? We will give it to you. He gave them gold. He gave them silver. Gave them all the goods that they wanted. But let's go to verse 17. Then the king of Assyria, another king, Sennacherib, now began to rule in Assyria. And this king, Sennacherib, sent the Tartan, his commander-in-chief, the Rapsaris, his brigade commander, and the Rapshake, the chief of staff from Lachish, with a great army against Jerusalem to King Ezekiah. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they had come up, they went and stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool, which was on the highway to the fuller's field. Hallelujah. So what did he do? Then they called to the king, and Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over this household, that's the senior special assistant in charge of domestic affairs. Hello? Because you need to relate this. 
They called him. He was the SSA in charge of domestic affairs. He was over the king's household. He was over Aso Villa. So they called him. Then Shebna described the secretary. Then Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. They came out to them. Then what happened? Verse 19. Then the Rapshake said to them, we said propaganda is information. Can I have an amen? So take note. The Rapshake said to them, Say now to Ezekiah your king, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this in which you trust? Is that not a threat? That's a voice of threat. You speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. And in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? What were they trying to do? Scaring them. Just true words. He was scaring them. He says, now look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust where? In him. What was he doing? He was bamboozling Ezekiah and his cohorts. True words. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Ezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? <laughs> Let's read on. Verse 23. Now therefore I urge you, give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses. If you are able to, on your path to put riders on them. What was he doing? Look at the psychological warfare. He was taking the spirit out of them. He was discouraging them. You say you trust in God. Which God? Which God is that? He said, look, I will give you 2,000 horses. Let's see whether you have enough horsemen that will be able to ride it. Look at the way he was deriding the king Ezekiah. Hallelujah. Sarcasm. He was hoodwinking them. This is psychological warfare. Can I have an Amen. Verse 24, how then will you repel one captain of the least of my master's servants and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen? The war has not begun, but look at the psychological warfare. Look at the way they have dispirited the army of Judah. Look at the way they have bombarded and bamboozled them. Look at the way he has scared them. Look at all of these tools and elements of propaganda being deployed. Hallelujah. Can I have an amen? amen? Let's read on. Have I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land. Look at these guys. Even quoting, he says, look, I'm not here by myself. It's God that sent me. Shout hallelujah. I say shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Because of our time, you can read Isaiah chapter 10. We can go into the theology of this. Truly, God set up Assyria. God empowered Assyria. God empowered them to punish his people. But it's for a time and for a season. Can I have an amen? amen. But here, see the servants of Sennacherib using it and making their boast that we are not here by our own strength, but by God. It's God that has sent us here. We are not doing this. Can you imagine how intimidated all the, I mean, servants of Ezekiah are? Next verse. Hallelujah. Amen. Second Kings 19. So it was, chapter 19, when Ezekiah had it, what did he do? Have they fired a gun? Just propaganda. When the king had it, he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. I love that. Where do you go when you are threatened? Where do you go when you are intimidated? When you are demoralized, where do you go? He tore his clothes! And he went into the house of the Lord. And as he was going into the house of the Lord, he sent Eliakim. His special advisor, domestic affairs, Shebna described, and the elders of the priest, covered with sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. Next verse. Glory to God. May you not turn to the arms of flesh. 
I say, when you are intimidated, may you learn to trust the Lord. May you learn to turn to the Lord. Ezekiah turned to the house of God and he sent to the prophets. Next verse. Verse 3. And they said to him, Thus says Ezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy. For the children have come to bath, but there is no strength to bring them forth. What a shame. Can you see a woman in a labor room who wants to give birth and has no strength to bush? If care is not taken, it may result in a stillbirth. It's a dangerous position to be. But as many of you as are in the states, I say when it is time for you to bring forth, supernatural strength will be supplied to you. I say supernatural strength will be supplied to you. You will not experience a stillbirth. The strength to push forth will be endowed upon you. In the name of Jesus. And some of you are pregnant with your ideas. The pregnancy has lasted for more than nine months. You are still pregnant. Some of you have carried that pregnancy for one year. Some of you have carried it for two years. You know what the problem is? You are pregnant with child, but you don't have strength to bath it. Some of you have been carrying your pregnancy. It's so real. That idea is, you know God gave you the idea. You have carried it for three years and you have not brought forth. It's because your strength is little. But I prophesy over you today that you will receive strength. Receive strength in the spirit. And you will give birth safely. In the name of Jesus. May you deliver that idea to your world. I say may that business be birthed safely. In the name of Jesus. Ezekiah declared a day of trouble. Verse 4. It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the rapture. Whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God. And will rebuild the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. So the servants of King Ezekiah came to Isaiah. And Isaiah said to them, I love this. Thus shall you say to your master, thus says the Lord. Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria has blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him. And he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land. And I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Can I have an amen? amen. As the prophet of God declared unto King Ezekiah, I declare to you today. I say, I declare to you today that the Lord will send a spirit upon all those that are intimidating you. The Lord will send a spirit upon those that are demoralizing you. He will send a spirit upon those that are threatening you. He will send a spirit upon those that are misleading you. In the name of Jesus, they will hear a rumor from today and they will withdraw to their own land. In the name of Jesus, you'll be free from every form of intimidation. You'll be free from every form of deceit. In the name of Jesus. And he said, I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Hallelujah. Thus says the Lord. Friends, listen to me. God's word is ever real. The precious voices sang to us. Psalm 119 verse 130. Your word is settled. It is what? Settled in heaven. God is the ultimate. He is the infinite. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I say glory to God. Hallelujah. Let me look at a few life applications of what this propaganda is all about. And then we will cut it off and continue next week. In relationships, I have seen ladies that were scared off and hoodwinked by their best friends to say no to their suitors. I don't know about you, but I have seen it. 
Oh, they share with their friend. Do you know that that guy is toasting me? He wants to marry me. He say, eh, is it that one? And then they scare you off through discouragements and negative comments and all manners of talk and the next thing you end up with the man marrying them. How many of you have ever seen such a thing? I have seen it. They use propaganda to discourage you. They say, eh, that one, eh, don't mind him. Oh, eh. Now, so they carry women up and down. It's a lie. They also have been eyeing, and they wish the man came to them. But since the man did not come to them, they will do everything to, they will use all manners of propaganda to scare you, to discourage you, to take away the spirit from within you, to deflate you. You will see nothing good in the man. Give them a few months. Maybe you even go and visit your friend and then you knock. The door is not opening. When he opens, say, ah, what happened? I can explain. There's no need of explanation. The situation has explained itself. Propaganda. May you not fall a victim. Amen. I said, may you not fall a victim. Amen. Glory to God. What of in business? We see it taking place in business. Your competitors, we see that happening in the business world. They undertake a demarketing campaign. They send text. Uh, so so and so bank is going under. So so and through the power of social media, they spread it. Everybody's rushing to collect their withdrawals. Has it not happened in this country? That is what? Propaganda. Information. Untrue. Maybe it has some form of truth in it. And then they hype it and bias it and they send it out. Begins everybody because I'm big. Shout hallelujah. You will not fall a victim. Amen. I say you will not fall a victim. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, information is powerful. The enemy is powerful. And he uses information to his advantage. Are you going to fall a victim? Or you are going to stay by the word of God. Your word, oh Lord, is settled. It is settled in heaven. I pray that you will not fall a victim. Yeah. What are those elements? Let me summarize. It misleads. It uses information to mislead us. To deceive us. It uses those information to deceive. To mislead us. He uses them to take away the steam out of us. He uses it to distort our ideas and to bring confusion into our lives. The second element we've shared with you is to intimidate. He will use an information to intimidate you, to terrify you, to raise an alarm before you, to threaten you and to bully you. Just simple information. And the third element is to demoralize you. To discourage you. Just a simple information, it discourages you. Dispirits you. Takes away the spirit from you. It depresses you and disheartens you. It deflates you and undermines all you have been working for. And the last one is to influence negatively your thinking or your behavior. And through these, just like we saw, the king of Assyria, through his emissaries, attacks Ezekiah, the king of Judah. If you are not careful, if you don't know where to run to, you run to the house of God because that is a house of refuge. Can I have an amen? amen? And then he sent for the prophets and the prophet brought forth a word that brought comfort to him. And that word strengthened him. And that word was able to grant him confidence and he was able to pull through the propaganda and psychological warfare that the enemy was fighting, that was launching against him. I pray that you will not be a victim. Amen. I say you will not be a victim Amen. in the name of Jesus. Don't give yourself to the enemy to mislead. If you don't have the correct information, he will mislead you. He will intimidate you if you don't know who has spoken to you, if you don't know him whom you believe. He will threaten you with his propaganda machine. But I'm praying that you will rise above all of this propaganda warfare in Jesus' name. 
whether it is white propaganda, the information is truthful, but it will bias it. Or it is gray propaganda. The information is mostly truthful and it contains nothing you can disprove, but all the same is propaganda. Or outright black propaganda. Concussions. Have wars not been concocted against people before? They will say you did this on so-so and so dates. They saw you with one girl and then they even tell you the name of the person and then publish it in the newspaper. Hallelujah. The information has gone already. You are now battling to save your life. You are the one saying, I swear I didn't do it. I will sue you for libel. But if the damage may have been done. That is propaganda. You will not fall a victim. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Rise up on your feet this morning.